Father, now bless us as we preach, teach the word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Our text verse is the same as it was Sunday before last. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Before I go any further, I want to visit something to shed a little light. Because the, the emphasis, this particular text revolves around the fourth um, verse four. Well, it actually revolves around the second verse and this, this, this proverb that's found in verse two. And for the proverb to catch on and to be recognized the way that it was, it had to have an element of truth in it. The problem with the proverb was the misapplication, how people misapplied it. The proverb is verse 2, uh, the second clause. The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. The root, what gave a degree of life to this proverb was Exodus chapter 20, and verse 5, it says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, speaking of false gods, nor serve them. For I, the Lord God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Hence, our fathers have eaten sour grapes, therefore the children's teeth are dull. We are suffering these hardships because of what our ancestors did. That's the root of the proverb. Taken from what the Lord said in Exodus chapter 5, chapter 20, and verse 5. But we have, we have taken license. and we've, uh, They did it in Ezekiel's day, and people have tried to do it in modern times because, you know, many people, and I talked about this the last time, have been under the impression and so many people got free Sunday before last, that they were somehow under a generational curse. And, you know, throughout the body of Christ, you know, it became popular to talk about generational curses. But when, first of all, when Jesus died, Jesus took all curses to the cross. And I'm here to say to you, who are listening to me, whether you're in the sanctuary or wherever you may be, you have never been under a generational curse. I would argue there have never been any such thing. It was a clever teachings, clever ploy, but we've got to look at what the Lord meant when he talked about visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children down to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, of ancestors who did me wrong. What it shows is this, and this is why each one of us really need to understand, I hope you hear me today, that none of us live to ourselves. My brothers, hear me. None of you live to yourself. I'm my own man and this is my life. I do what I want. There's no such thing. Everything that we do have lasting repercussions. Amen. I want you to hunt your neighbor and say, wake up. 
I did that because I saw one person asleep. And I didn't want to embarrass him. So I'm not going to even look in the direction that they went. Wake up, because you need to hear this. So I'm a good guy. See, if I was a mean preacher, I would say, wake that guy up over there. When the Lord said visiting, what, what it shows is that when a person sins, a person does wrong, the effect of their sin and wrongdoing doesn't end when that person dies. The person is dead. But what they set in motion doesn't go into the grave with them. You don't want to be the son or the daughter of a man who was a serial killer. You won't be a serial killer. You can't inherit serial killing. But the effects of what your daddy did if people know that you are the offspring of a serial killer, even though he's dead and his serial killing ways died with him, but that reputation and, and the damage that he did to so many others still exists. And it can affect the way people, or let's be, let's be honest, it will affect the way people see you. And if your great, if your granddaddy was a serial killer, even though he's dead, the effects of what he did didn't go into the grave with him. There are still people who are living with family members uh, who are no longer here because your daddy lived and did what he did. And they may be upset with you. Or think that you are bad seed. And you may be the best of a person. But they'll think that you're a bad seed because of what your daddy did. There's not very much you can do to change their hearts and their minds. You shouldn't even set out to change it. You should set out to make sure you don't buy their thinking. That's it. Just don't let what they think of you affect how you see yourself. Amen. You have to know that you are not your father. You are not your ancestors. There are people who come from families where mom and dad were members of the clan. but they don't have a racist bone in their body. Madeline O'Hara, the woman who led the charge in getting prayer taken out of the public schools and was an atheist, her son became a preacher. Now we're still living with the effects of what she did. We're still living with it. I mean, third, fourth generation, fifth, so forth, and so on. We're still living with it. But her son gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And he did not walk in the vein of his mother. See, the effect of your sin, uh, not only does it not uh, go in the grave when you go into the grave, but the effects of your sin may hurt others. You can sin. And uh, go to jail. Okay? You're in. You're locked up. You do your time. You pay your debt to society. You're a free man now. And should be accepted as such. But while you were locked up, your children needed their daddy. Things happen to them 
why you were locked up. Oh, they, they looked out in the stands and they saw other people's pops and moms at the game supporting them. But they didn't see their daddy because he was doing time. Or doing something. He's out now. He's free now. He paid his debt to society. It should not be held against him because he paid his debt. But the effects of his not being there still linger on. And there's work to be done. Oh, he don't have to be in jail. He can be a pastor. And that church, when he should have been there for his family. Or he can be a player. And with the red dress, when he should have been with his family. Or whatever, whatever. You know, name it. The effects of the misbehavior lives on. Long after you stop misbehaving, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. This is why incest is such a wicked thing. You ruin your descendants for years to come because you wanted to get your rocks off. You messed with your daughter. The Lord has saved you now. You washed in the blood. But, but she still don't trust me. She still won't leave her daughter or grandchildren with you. She still feel your hand. Years later. And you've repented. And you can't go back and fix it. You can't undo it. But this is how it is visited. I'm preaching good. So people have to. Reckon with that. You were a drunk in the days of your strength. Well, you're an old man now. Love the Lord. Speak in tongues 24 7. But your children remember. See, this is why I don't get into squabbles with families about their loved ones. I don't try to convince nobody. Living or dead, your, your mama or your grandma was a child of God. You can't tell the daughter or the son who their parents were. They look at you like you're crazy. They know. Now, you know what they were since you met them. See, when you met them, they were saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. And that with a mighty burning fire. And that's real. But the effects of when they wore it. That the others still remember. That's why young mother be careful. Who you're with. with what you let your children see. Good preaching. When you preach the Bible, see, the Bible deals with everything. See, the effects, it's gone. The person is no longer that person. And you, you've got to let it go. You've got to forgive them. But you also got to work on yourself to get past that yourself. Otherwise, you will grab hold to the proverb. 
Our fathers have eaten sour grapes. Therefore, the children's teeth are set on edge. I say to fathers and mothers in here, think about how you want your family to be. Think beyond the here and now. Learn to think generationally. There's something to think about other than mag rims, shiny cars, fancy suits. Think about your family. And don't just think about them while you live. One thing that I have many good things I can say about my son-in-law, but the best thing, the best impression that he made on me when he was dating my daughter. That was one thing that I was looking for more than anything else. Uh, is that he saved? Well, no. Well, no, that's one of them, but uh, all of them she dated that I met, that I know was saved. But that wasn't, that, that wasn't it. That wasn't it alone. Cause that wasn't it. I'll be honest with you. That was something else that Patrick Wooden needed to see. That would give me rest. They'll tell you, I'm not over their house all the time. Amen. I don't, I don't show up uninvited. When I come, they ask me to come. That's a good sign. That means I'm content. Amen. I'm not scared. I'm not worried. I needed to see it one. There's one thing. And he showed it to me, and not knowing. And I didn't tell him what it was. Because if you tell uh, uh, a ninja, he will try to fool you and will put on a show until you say yes and then put a ring on her finger and you, the, you, you don't see him no more. You know what I need to see? I need to see things that would cause me to believe that he would take good care of her when I'm dead and gone. As long as I live, she's got her daddy now. I wanted to know just by talking to him, listening to him, hearing him uh, surmise, sizing up his worldview. I found out that he's going to take care of me even while I live. <laughs> and not just when I'm dead. See, you got to think beyond right now. Come on, man, sell these drugs, man. Come on, get involved in this. If that's attractive to you, you're not thinking. You're not thinking. So you got to think. You got to think. See, one of the things that we, uh, we, we got to learn how to do is we got to think. Christianity is the ultimate thinking man's religion. And some of us, we, some of us love to feel, but we seldom think. You got to think, 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 think. Because let me tell you something. There are, you single men, uh, uh, there are children in your loins. The Bible says when, a when, when uh, Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek, the Bible said that uh, Isaac and Jacob paid tithe also. And they weren't born yet. They were in his loins. So when people say, well, as a young man, you just go out and sow your wild oats. Look, as a young man, you better have some sense. You better have some sense. These lifestyles and different things that are thrown at you are things that can hurt you generationally. I'm spending, I'm spending too much time on this. So this is how the iniquity of the fathers are visited upon the children, the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. But I have good news now. Just stay with me for a few minutes. Among the many problems that this denounced 
proverb presented was that it expressed the attitudes of fatalism and irresponsibility. See, the exiles, you know, they, they grabbed hold of this proverb because it was like a psychological refuge. Well, we're suffering these hardships because of what our forefathers did. And let's, let's give them credit. It's hard being defeated, taken from your uh, home country, whistled off almost a thousand miles to a land that you're not familiar with, sat down in a country, and now you got to eke out a living with no end in sight. Uh, Ezekiel was among the first of the captives, yeah. of the deported people. And the people, they were, they were broken. And they said, this has happened to us because of what our forefathers did. And it's, listen, Breaking their spirits because it, it the, 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 the proverb promotes the idea of fatalism. And, and, and fatalism is the ideology that things happen and they are irrevertible. That it's everything <clears throat> comes from fate. Everything is predetermined. So since this is my life. And this was destined for me. And I, 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 there's nothing that can do, uh, that I can do to change this. It was predetermined that these events happened to me. So then, therefore, I won't try to do any better. Think of the people who think fatalist. who think that being on government assistance is their lot for life, who think that they can't do any better than what they're doing right now. Fatalism traps you. It robs you of your desire to make things better. Amen. Amen. Fatalism makes you a loser. And then fatalism robs you of all of your, uh, it makes you irresponsible. It promotes the idea of irresponsibility. It's not my fault that I'm this broke or down this low or in this situation. So they try to, a lot of our leaders who speak to us try to make us think that way. You know, as a black man, you can't do anything. As a black man, you can't get anywhere. As a black person in America, you can't, you can't, you can't. So it makes people feel good being down. It, rely, it relieves us of all of our personal accountability and responsibility for being down and out. Because we can't do any better because it's fatal. It's, it's fatalism and it had to happen. So it's not my fault. That I'm like I am. And since it is not my fault, then there is no need for me to try and do any better. And I have no guilt for my deplorable existence. Because I'm not responsible. It was my daddy's fault. My mother's fault. Amen. Fatalism have you thinking that you can't do anything about the way things are. Irresponsibility. You don't have to do anything about your situation because it's not your fault. This proverb had worked on them. Will you give me just a few more minutes to preach? What made the proverb appealing is that it is the tendency 
of fallen man, you have to admit it, to blame someone else for his own problems and situation. It's human. God bless my mother. Mama, you ain't got to sit back there. We're used to you coming in and, come on, mama, come on. It's my mama. Come on, mama. Praise the Lord. Say amen for my mother. That lady right there brought me into the world. And she was my first evangelist. First person to tell me about Jesus. And God, 83 years old. And I'm so glad to see it. And I got a blessing for you today, too. Amen. That's my mama, y'all. I'm like Willie Neal Johnson. You know, I always love my mother. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, now listen to this now. See, most people, most people are blame avoidant to some degree. Let's be honest. All too willing to consider the idea that their problems are not of their own making. We're blame avoidant. I'm in this situation, but I didn't cause it. I have problems, but I didn't create them. It just feels good. To blame mom and dad. It just feels good to blame white folk and black folk. It feels good, you know, to blame the police, to blame the system, to blame the church. Oh, my Lord, to blame the church. To blame the country, to blame the football coach, to blame that ex. It's always someone else's fault. Among the shameful things that happened at the fall is that Adam and Eve both became blame avoidant. God came and asked Adam, Bible says in Genesis chapter 3 verse 9 through 13, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was Erom naked. E R O M. See, in uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 25, the Bible teaches that they were naked. That is a different Hebrew word, Aram. A R O M. 225 naked means it was nakedness without shame. Right. Nakedness and purity. Right. Nakedness but holy. But after the fall, it was Eram. Uh -huh. Nakedness with shame. Yeah. Nakedness, uh, that is, naked without the, uh, uh, having broken the covenant of God. Right. Two different words. Yes. Praise the Lord. And, uh, uh, so he said here, uh, I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, God said to him, who told thee that thou wast naked? Has thou, notice God puts the responsibility on him. Has thou, has thou eaten of the tree that I told you that I commanded thee? Notice God's talking to him. Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat of? Because when God gave the command, Eve was not even in existence. See, they, they, the police didn't do me right. Did you break the law? Let's start right there. See, we want to we want to just skip that, that part. Praise the Lord. There are those who try to diminish the line between legal immigration and illegal immigration. They are not the same. One is right and the other is wrong. You can't have a country 
we, they did a study the other day that if the people who wanted to come to America could come, the numbers would be 157 million. Do you know what that would do to all of us? In a country of what, 350, 360 million, you add another 157 million? Life as we know it is gone. They won't tell you that. But it would destroy, it would overwhelm the system. We become a nation of cannibals and fighting. It becomes the survival of the fittest. There's a, there's a difference. You know, I don't know why God called me to preach this stuff to you. But you know what? It's better than shucking and jiving preaching, isn't it? Amen. It's better than that. You have heard enough sermons about your haters. And who don't like you. And it's not your fault. But God asked him, did you eat of the tree? That I told you not to eat of. He didn't ask him who told you anything. How did you know? Did you eat? He put the onus, which is my point. He put the onus on him. Wouldn't it be good if more parents was like that in dealing with their children? Wouldn't it be good if more mothers were like that? More fathers? But no, it's the school. It's that teacher. That teacher just don't like my child. It's that bus driver. It's all of the other kids. It's everybody but your, the, your child. The one who's sitting there in trouble. You're training him to be a loser. He'll never make a man with you changing his diapers and he's a teenager because you never held him responsible. God asked Adam, did you? Because I know what I told you. I know what I told you, Adam. Uh, uh, God says to Adam, I was there. I know what I said to you. I told you before I made Eve. Before I made you a woman. Before I even, uh, before I even gave the idea. Chapter 2, verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest, that thou eatest of this tree, thereof thou shalt surely die. The next verse says, and the Lord says, it is not good that man should be alone. See, what wasn't no woman when God gave him the instruction. What did Adam do? Adam practiced blame avoidance. He said to the Lord, verse 12 says, and the man said, the woman. That thou gavest me. Now, now, now really, really, if you're really thinking, he, he blamed Eve, but he really didn't. He blamed Eve. He shifted it to her. But you know who he really blamed? He blamed God. Read the Bible. The woman you gave me. Now, he didn't say that when God first gave him to her. He said, wow! Now this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Yeah, I know, and I know what to do. And she shall be called woman, and oh my, he was a happy camper. But when it went south, all of a sudden, God, I would have been better off had you left me the way that I was. Blame avoidance. He shifts it to her. And to him by implication. And then God uh, looked uh, at the woman and said to her, holding her responsible, 
Uh-huh. And the Lord said to the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And she said, wait a minute. Uh-uh, y'all ain't going to put all this on me. Oh, sir, we're shifting again. And she said, the serpent. At least, at least she was, at least she was honest. She said, he beguiled me. He beguiled, the serpent tricked me. And, and the New Testament bears out that Eve was deceived. Adam wasn't. See, they were naked in 2 and 25, Aram. But the, but the serpent in 3 and 1 was subtle, Arum, A-R-U-M. So the, you, got, you got innocent Adam and Eve, and you got the slickster, the serpent. And the serpent beguiled Eve, and she did eat. Factually, they all told the truth. Amen. But they should have owned it. They should have owned it. Adam blamed Eve, and Eve blamed the serpent, and God cursed them all. I'm going to preach in just a minute. The truth is today, today that all three were culpable. There was enough culpability to go around to everyone. Sure your parents failed in some ways. Sure the, the country is imperfect. Sure there are bad teachers. Yes there are bad police officers. Oh yeah. Uh, you can get hooked up with a bad person. But don't. Fail. To own. Your part in it. That's my point. See, I'm not preaching as though it's a perfect country. <laughs> Amen. Now, y'all got it too cold. Ain't it? See, I, I told you. I got to try to preach. And uh, I helped, though. Now, now it's, look at this. They were all held accountable. But I got good news. I have good news. I, I have good news, Mother Dijonay. Mother, the situation was not, however, fatal. God did something. So I, got good, the, the, I, got, I got good news for you today. Now. God did something that showed hope. God did something that showed mercy. God did something that showed love. And the Lord did something that said to them, you can do better than this. You can get up from where you are. You still have a future. Tell your neighbor, you can do better than this. You can get up. From where you are, you still have a future. What am, what am I attacking? I'm attacking fatalism. Fatalism will keep you comfortable where you are. I'm here to tell you that, that, that oh my God, the, the, God knows how to put the sun in your tomorrow. The Lord knows how to bring the sun out. What did God do? Do to just shift the whole dynamic. So he did something. After he pronounced curses, after he let them have it, after he held them responsible, guess what he did? He performed a sacrifice. He took animals Oh, it's in the Bible. It says in verse 21 of, of, of chapter 3, And unto Adam and also to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. 
That means there are tomorrows. That means you can move on from here. Because notice what God did now. He, he, he didn't. He, you know, people say that the Lord clothed them in skins. No, he didn't. He clothed them, the scripture says, in coats, which is literally garments, which is literally a tunic. God took the skins from animals, sacrificed them, and then God, he didn't put no hard skins on them. God became the loom. God became the factory. God began to work it and make it soft and pliable and comfortable. And God made coats. God made clothing. And I, isn't it something for the Lord to be your tailor? To get something custom made by God himself. And when he put it on him, you know it fit right. You know everything with the right length, the right side, the sleeves were right. Everything was right. And he clothed them. And the word clothe, the word clothe uh, in the Old Testament, to clothe, uh, a part of the word to atone means to cover. When God killed the animal, he atoned, he covered them. And you know what they did? You know what they did? They got up from there. Amen. The Bible shows that instead of being trapped in fatalist thought, that they went on and they started a family. Next to, the next time we read about them, now they were driven from the garden. But the next thing I know, they got up and chapter 4 says, and Adam knew Eve. Oh, they're moving on up. I hear the Jeffersons moving on up. They're moving up. He knew Eve and she conceived and bore him twins. And we find as we study chapter 4, he taught his sons to worship. He taught them about God because Adam, uh, Cain and Abel offered sacrifices to the Lord. Am I right? And as time went on, not only did they go from there, but if you read chapter 5 of the book of Genesis, chapter 5, see, uh, somebody ought to shout chapter 5. And shout this, in my life, that's a chapter 5. Bible says in chapter 5 verse 3, And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness and after his image and called his name Seth. Now, Abel is dead. But isn't it good that God didn't let it end with Cain being a vagabond, driven out, Adam kept on living. Somebody ought to shout, I got to keep living. Adam kept living and, uh, and bore a son. And, 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 and the next son he had said, in his own likeness, the boy was just like him. It's like Adam spit him out. The splitting image of his father and named him Seth. And the days of uh, and the days of Adam, after he begat Seth, was eight hundred, eight hundred years. And you know what? He lived. Look at this. After he lived one hundred and thirty years and got Seth, he lived another eight hundred years. And look at this. He Adam begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Adam were nine hundred and. 30 years. Woo! There's only three men in the whole Bible who lived longer than he did. And that was uh, Noah, Gerard, Methuselah. Adam was number four. And Adam lived 130 years. And then the physical fulfillment of what God said in Genesis 2, 17 came to pass. And he died. But look at what he made of his life. After the fall, after God cursed him, after he became blame of order, after we see him at his low, but it didn't end right there. The man got up and the man made something of his life. I want you to know that God has tomorrows for you. God has next year. 
God has a future for you, but you can't let the devil trap you. Somebody ought to tell the devil, get out of my head. I'm not going to let you trap me in the situation that I'm in right now. I'm not going to let you define me. God has more for me. There's a chapter five coming. Mm. Somebody ought to praise him right now. I got a question for you. What are you going to do with the time that you have left? You sitting there bemoaning yesterday, trapped in last year, can't get past yesterday's failure. You are buying the devil's lie. You're still alive. The blood's still running warm in your vein. God has something for you, but you got to let the Lord do it. Hey, somebody shout something to him. I'm still here. Do I have anybody who can say I'm still here? Amen. My cane may be gone. My cane may be a vagabond and Abel may be dead, but there's a Seth on the way. And there's time on the way. So I think I'll just get up from where I am. I think I'll work to make my situation better. I think I'll accept my role in my failures and just move forward because if God be for me. Hmm, who can be against me? Yeah, so I'm closing. I'm going to close now. Amen. I'll preach hard in the Sundays to come. Amen. Mother, two or three days ago, I lost, uh, caught a bad cold and settled in my throat. So, uh, but it's all right. Yeah, so he said, don't, don't say this anymore. Our fathers have eaten sour grapes. Children's teeth are set on edge. He says, now, let me give you an example. What if a man be just? And do that which is lawful and right. That is just moral and ethically good. What if a man, thank you, praise the Lord. What if a man be moral and ethically good? And if that man doesn't eat food offered to idols, and if that man doesn't worship a false god, if that man lives according to the law, and you can't be a moral and ethically good man and not teach your children morals and ethics and pass it down, pass it down. He says, that man is going to live. That man. That's what the Bible means when it says, follow, uh, mark the perfect man and behold the upright. See, because at the end, if you follow where they're headed, they're headed somewhere. They're going to have money. They're going to have influence. They're going to be healthy. They're going to have a good run. Now, they're going to eventually die, but, but things are going to work for them because of what they're doing, how they're living, the ethics, the morals. Says so that man's going to live. He's going to enjoy the best of this life. Hallelujah. But if that man has a son. All right, now, we're one generation removed. Keep in mind, everybody has free will. So you can't get past free will. Free will. Free will. Praise the Lord. Verse 10 says, if he has a son, that is, and that son decide to be a robber. You see that? A shedder of blood. Well, how in the world can an ethical and moral and upright man have a son who is a robber? Free will. See, because let me tell you something. After you've been taught, it's up to you to obey. 
What do you do with what we've told you? If you ignore it, then you will pay. If you apply it, you will reap the benefits of it. Amen. All that a teacher can do is teach. See, there's another dynamic. See, so, uh, you know what? One of the things that I didn't like about being in the uh, school business when we had the academy is that all of the parents thought that their children was gifted and talented. Say it right. Say it right. that, that, that's, that's a problem. Because now, every, if everybody's gifted and talented, then no one is gifted and talented. See, now, and even in cases where the child was slow, that their tests that determined, you still couldn't convince the parents. No, my child's gifted and talented. All right? So, you know, the problem is the school. It's the teacher. It's everybody but the students. Ooh. Anybody who's been in the teaching profession, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. You have to do. The Bible says you shall know if you, as you follow on to know the Lord. You can't just know him. You can't just know God. It takes work to know the Lord. It takes effort to know God. You shall seek me and you shall find me when you have sex for me with all of your heart. Oh, it takes effort. You know why many of us don't do well in Christianity? We're too lazy. You're too lazy to make a good Christian. You won't read. You won't study. You won't pray. You won't, you won't eke out time with God. You don't want it bad enough. Salvation is not for the passive. It's for the desperate. I want this thing. Do I have anybody in here who want this thing? You got to want it. Nobody stumbles into success. Nobody stumbles to the top. Nobody stumbles to be good at what they do. Takes application. Takes work. Some people are more talented than others. But you know what? Talent can only take you. But so far, give me a man with all the natural talents and give me another man with the work ethic. I'll take the guy with the work ethic. Because the guy with the work ethic will beat the man with the talent every day because he's going to outlast him. Be careful with good talent. Sometimes because everything comes easy. Oh, bless God. You can just do it. You don't apply yourself as you are. Sooner or later, you'll run into something that's going to make a difference. Thank God for that nice figure. So yes, I don't work out of anything. I eat anything I want. Don't go to the gym and I'm still, nothing. Okay. Amen. But now, ah, uh, time is filled with swift transition. Oh, Lord. See, at, at, at some point, at some point, you got to do something. You got to apply yourself. Or you just be full of excuses. Yeah, I kind of had ch children in college. I had children. And that's what happened. If he has a son, and that son doesn't do right, he said, that son shall die. He's going to die. He's going to lose out. He won't have, he won't get what this life has to offer. Even though his father got what life had to offer. But if along the way, that son has a son. Now I'm at the grandson. 
And notice what the text says. The text says, and if now, verse 14, and I'm done. Uh, now, lo, if he beget a son, notice this now, that seeth all his father's sins, which he hath done. Boy, I was looking at his daddy. All right? And here's the thing. And considereth. Oh, he thinks about it. He mulls it over. He thinks about it. Hallelujah. I love my daddy. But I, you know what kept me off of drugs? What it did to him. What it did to him. What it did to me through what it did to him. Two of the greatest days of my life is where I remember when I saw him. I don't have a sad story. Like a hero. That, that, that wonderful lady sitting right there. My mama always told me good things about my daddy. See, so I always felt like I had a superman for that. See, amen. Now, some of you, you get mad and you just tell the truth, your daddy ain't no good. He ain't no good. He's no good. He's no good. All right. But now you're talking. Y'all kind of help me out. You're talking to his seed. And if you convince him that his daddy is no good, then you've also convinced him that he's at least 50% no good. Every argument you have, you want to make sure the children get in it. You're going to destroy your family. Don't, don't grow up to be like your daddy. Don't be, don't be like him. Even though daddy may not be anything, don't be like your daddy. Get, yes, mommy. You, get, you know what he's going to do? He's going to grow up and be just like his daddy. Because you're teaching him that he's no good. This is good preaching. <sighs> but you got to, when I saw what it did to him, I knew even, even before I got saved, I wasn't going to do I wasn't going to get on no drugs. Mm -mm. I didn't want anything to control me like that. I like beer. Uh, but I, I uh, mm -mm, wasn't going to wasn't going to do that. I thought about it. I thought about it. I thought about it. And it ought, it ought to work both ways. You who have a good example of a father. Why are you why are you going to rebel? You ought to think about it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. His behavior, his lifestyle, his ways have produced all of this. Why would I fight this? Then if he, was, if he wasn't good, look at what it did to him. I'm, I'm 57. My daddy wasn't ready to die at 38. Ain't nobody ready to die at 38. You ain't ready to leave here at 38. You just arrived. Right. You're, you're in the prime. You, man, you're, you're in producing years. Mm -hmm. Gone. But not through natural death. Mm -hmm. The life. life. That's what you got to consider. I thought about it. And, and then, then God gave me an alternative. Mother Turner, your husband. He is a man of God. He is a man of God. Showing me a, a new world. I had, I considered, this is what I want. This is what I want. If I go this way, I can do that. Amen. But you got to consider. You know when I consider these things? I was 16 and 17. So it's a 40 and hadn't began to consider. 45, 50, and you still act like a kid. No, no, 
There's no, there's no reason. There's no reason that everybody in the family got to prop you up. There's no reason. That means you're not thinking. And it means that they're not thinking. Because they would think if they were thinking, they'd stop propping you up. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Because That's right. That's right. it don't work. There's a difference between helping out and propping up. What's the difference? Helping out comes around every now and again. Propping up every day. I borrowed twenty dollars from my mother when I was nineteen. I didn't, I didn't say she gave me 20. I borrowed it. Now, she'd give me so much more than that. There's no price for what she'd given me. She gave me life and raised me. But I'm, but I'm, I'm headed somewhere else now. But I understood that when I reached a certain place, I got to make it. He considered. This is a good preacher. He, con he considered. And you know what the young man decided to do? He decided not to be like his daddy in the text. He decided to be like his granddaddy. So it tells you right there, there's no generational curse. Because if that was a curse, then he would have had no choice. He wouldn't have considered anything. I said the last time, those of you who are carrying guilt, For not being the perfect parent, let that go. Because God has stepped in. And the Lord have given your children and everybody else options. Now, if they stay fatalist in their thinking and just stay there and don't take it, that ain't on you. That's not on you. My mother owes me no apology. Amen. And you know what? My daddy don't either. That's right. That's right. Praise Lord. They gave me a break. <laughs> he gave birth to me. Then the Lord set before me, as he has set before you, life and death, right. blessings and cursings. Amen. Amen. You can be somebody if you want to. Oh, yeah. or you cannot. Father, his son, and his grandson. They argued. The next time I'm going to deal with how Ezekiel had to further elaborate. Because when he laid that out, it was not to welcoming ears. Just like not everybody welcome what I'm saying today. Some of you have major problems. I do not care. I'm telling you the truth. I love you enough to tell you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. They had major, they had major problems. You know why? Because the, the, the hard times was a little easier for them psychologically when they could say to themselves, it's my father's fault. It's mama's fault. It's someone else's fault. They caused this. It got rough when, the, when Ezekiel said, it's your fault. What? Yeah, you. It's, your, it's on you. It's on you. My mother was not very wordy in life lessons. She was more demonstrative. She had a way. I love her for it. One of the greatest lessons she taught me, one day, one summer's day, we were at the little mall in Rockingham, strip mall. Don't, don't think Crabtree. <laughs> and uh, we were walking that hot summer's day into J.C. Penney. And somehow, 
I tripped and I fell and I skint my knee. I remember it like it was yesterday and I started to cry. My mother, being the great teacher that she is, kept walking and said, get up. And never looked back and said, stop crying. That lesson helps me do this. Because in this, there's a lot of scraping your knees. A lot of disappointments and different things happen. I have to get up. Not let you see me cry. And go on into the storm. Amen. And sometimes you do such a good job that people think it's easy. Every one of us have a choice. Everybody who wants to walk in, and I don't want you to come for prayer just because I'm opening the altar. I'm, I don't feel bad if people don't come. I mean, you come if you want to. You don't. I, I hold God, God responsible to your response. I want to pray for everybody who feels that there's a self moment a Genesis chapter 5 that there's another act that there's another season for you that you can move on from where you are and become that person that you're not going to let fatalism hold you if you're here Come quickly. I want to pray for you. That God will give you another uh, bite at the apple. <laughs> that that's, that's more for me.
gave me choices. Gave me choices. Took the fatalism. Made me take responsibility. Ah. Lift your hands to Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you. Flawed. <laughs> yeah, Lord. But God, we've heard something that says a lot about the time that we have left. Glory. We've heard something today. I see the Lord as I'm praying, putting coats on people. I see the Lord putting tunics on people on the altar. That hand you may feel around your shoulders, that's God. He's already measured you and he's going to fit you well. Glory to God. Hey, God. Can you ready because that's his way of telling you I have a future for you. You're not dead yet. I have something for you. Glory, glory. Father, we receive our coats. We receive our tunics. We receive our garments in the name of Jesus. And Father, we believe for a self moment. We believe that there's a future that you have for us and tomorrow will be better than today hallelujah oh god our future looks better than our present we thank you right now we thank you right now god we want to be who you would have us to be we will be that that grandson who considered and decided to go all the way in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Oh, right now, begin to declare who you are. Begin to declare what you shall be. Begin to declare, for if you define yourself, no one else can define you. You ought to say something. You ought to say something. I'm a winner in Jesus' name. I'm an overcomer in Jesus' name. I win in Jesus name I'm gonna live in Jesus name I'm shaking off my God the pain of yesterday I'm moving from it in the name of Jesus thank you Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord yeah 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 yes Lord yes Lord Yes to your will, yes to your way, yes to your word. I receive it. Lord, I receive it. Oh God, as I close. I pray for the mental capacity of every believer on this altar. For Lord, it takes strong thinking and a strong mind and a determined heart, a determined spirit to change one's trajectory, to change one's ways of thinking, to break out of deep-seated and deep-rooted habits and ways and viewpoints and a worldview that is one that is fatal. Father, we release these things. Hey! We let that go. We let it go. We change our minds. Hallelujah. I'm going to close my prayer, but somebody will ask God, Lord, change my mind. I live better if you change my mind. I can see things better if you would just change my mind. Ooh, Lord, change my mind in the name of
Lord Jesus. Glory, 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 glory. I can be somebody. I can live on from here. I can make something. It's not too late. I don't accept what they've said about me. I don't accept what my parents told me. I don't accept the boundaries and limitations that others set for me. I don't even accept the ones that I set for myself. I give my mind in my heart to the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God praises. Glory to God.